Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Hussain Haydari and today we're going to continue our discussion on manufacturing processes uh, to produce polymeric objects. So we started this discussion um, talking a little bit about the processing temperatures and some of the conventional manufacturing processes. So uh, just to recap, these were some of the um, conventional manufacturing processes that we looked at um, in the first lecture of this week. Uh, we looked at compression molding, you see there in the top right. And what it is, is basically you heat up the, um, the feedstock material, which can be solid or it can be molten. Um, and you basically, uh, so this can be, if it's a thermoset, it's a monomer liquid, or it could be actually a solid. And uh, in both cases, um, even if it's a solid, you're going to turn it to a liquid molten material. Um, when you heat it here, um, and, and in some cases you don't, you actually keep it within the, um, so if you remember, I mentioned that you don't always need to go um, way beyond the melting temperature. In some cases, a little bit below, but between the glass transition and melting is also fine. So you you can have a case where you've got a thermoplastic material and you don't want to really melt it all the way down. You just want to deform it a little bit. So you actually keep it a little bit below the uh, melting temperature. And so when you actually do the compression molding, it deforms into the geometry that you want it to deform to. So this can actually be a molten material. It could be um, a liquid monomer for a thermoset, or it could actually, in some cases, be a solid if the deformation here is not that significant. Okay. Um, the other process was uh, extrusion and injection. So injection here we had injection molding. Um, basically, is the idea of um, having the feedstock molten through a spreader that has these. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a heated barrel and within that heated barrel there's this uh, threaded screw and what it does is that it um, once the ram pushes in the feedstock and usually the feedstock is in the form of some beads some solid beads it gets molten and it is forced to go through the spreader at which point it is concentrated into a nozzle and the nozzle cools it down and injects it into the mold cavity. And similarly, if you eliminate the mold cavity part and you extrude it out through a shaping die, which has a certain shape, a cross section, um, you can actually uh, produce some certain extrusion shapes, like the one you see here, it could be a tube or an extrusion, a, um, a, a rather complex design, or a simple sheet. Um, and you actually have a continuous process producing that um, over and over again. Uh, another process, which is quite specialized, was the uh, process you see here, where you actually have the uh, air injected into um, your polymer as it's been extruded. And so this is called blown film extrusion, and the name actually suggests what it's doing here. Um, you're blowing through the film material that you've got there, producing huge air bubble, depending on whether you uh, want to collapse that air bubble or you want to uh, keep it open um, through these rollers you can design the temperature and the clearance so that you can produce a bag uh, which is an open plastic sheet or a single sheet of material. So um, these are some of the conventional processes and as you can see most of them are based on mechanically forming your um, final shape. Okay, so you physically and mechanically um, forge in to the polymer the shape that you want to. Okay, and that's why typically these are, are reshaping processes, or in the classification of manufacturing processes, we call these formative processes. What it means is that you actually um, you have the material already, you just deform it, whether you're melting it down, whether you're curing it from a liquid monomer state, or whether you're actually deforming it from a solid with one shape to another shape. In all of those cases, you have the feedstock already with a shape or geometry. You compress and form it into a new 
shape and geometry. Okay, so that's the idea with these formative processes is that you actually deform the material um, and the volume before and after stays the same. Okay, you're just changing the shape. You keep the volume and the mass the same. Now, in contrast, there are two other types of manufacturing processes, which you're probably familiar with from the metals um, chapters. Uh, the first one is subtractive. For instance, when you have a milling machine, when you have a lathe, um, and, and the tip of your uh, mill, for instance, is going through the object, carving out pieces of it into these uh, metal uh, chips that fly away, uh, you're actually carving an object out of your initial volume. So you're going to actually subtract some of that volume to get to the final shape. So you're actually um, somewhat uh, wasting some material into, the, into these chips here. Um, and and you basically, the useful part of it is this net shape that you're ending up with. Okay, so you're getting rid of material, it's subtractive. The other type is additive. An additive is when you actually deposit material. It's when you actually start um, from zero and then you gradually and slowly build up your final shape by adding material on top of previous um, material. Okay, so you just start from zero and then you make the base and you move on all the way up top to uh, till you get to the end of the object um, and your final shape is obtained. Okay, so you're basically adding up material, um, accumulating material in a certain shape and design in order to uh, achieve the final shape of the object. So again, there are three classes of processes. The majority of polymer processing is here in terms of the conventional and old style polymer processing is formative processes. Okay, injection molding, blown film extrusion, compression molding and extrusion, they're all part of this class, formative processes. And that is the conventional uh, landscape of processes for polymers. The new landscape lies here in the additive part. Okay, where we actually melt material and then we selectively add it. We don't compress it or physically, mechanically shape it. And um, subtractive, there are also examples of subtractively manufacturing uh, polymers, but that is some, for some very special polymers that maintain um, their shape and their mechanical properties at elevated temperatures where these bits interacting with the shape. So for instance, um, you may have seen engraving. You may have seen engraving on acrylic, okay? So when you're actually engraving acrylic or cutting acrylic sheets into a certain shape, that's exactly what you're doing, okay? Um, but this is a very small and narrow group of processes when it comes to polymers. So let's talk about additive manufacturing processes. That's going to be the focus for this lecture is rather than talking about formative processes, which you already did, we're going to talk about additive processes. And this is where it gets really exciting. So um, another word for additive manufacturing processes, 3D printing processes. Um, the name may not accurately reflect what it is, but you're actually printing. In other words, you are um, imprinting or printing um, some pattern onto a substrate. And in case of what we had previously, it was a 2D printing process on paper. Uh, here it's a 3D process where we're printing a 3D object. So the first type of 3D printing process is um, zero dimensional. And again, um, this is the best sort of classification that you can find for 3D printing processes, as it kind of gives you a meaningful classification, just like what I, um, of gave you here with the um, classification of manufacturing process in general, I'm going to actually give you a similar take um, in, in 3D printing processes that gives you sort of a meaningful ca characterization of the processes and a classification that actually makes sense. So in that sense, the first type of additive manufacturing processes is zero dimensional. Okay, so 
what does zero dimensional mean? It means that what's a zero dimensional object? It's a point, right? A one dimensional object is a line. A two dimensional object is a plane. Zero dimensional means that it's printing one point at a time. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if you're trying to build this object here, you have to have the object printed one point at a time. So what this process, for example, a, a good example of this process is an extrusion process, a FDM process. And you might have seen these FDM printers. Um, I'll show you in the next slide how it works. But it basically has to print this object one point at a time in every layer. And then once it's printed one layer, it goes to the next layer. And then again, it scans the entire layer one point at a time until it can print the entire object. And um, I'll show you how this actually works. So these are all examples of um, zero dimensional 3D printing processes. And what they do is you can see the tip of the nozzle there is scanning the surface one point at a time, okay? Whether it be a plastic in this case or concrete there, um, you can see that the tip of the nozzle is extruding material and gradually building up the object one point at a time, meaning that it has to scan the objects every in uh, every cross section of it one point at a time until it builds up the overall object. So it can be a plastic that you're printing. It could be concrete. It could be chocolate, right? You can see here you're extruding chocolate out of this um, extruding filament. Uh, sorry, extruding um, nozzle. So the filament here is chocolate. So uh, what you see here in this case is a jelly sort of material. Um, but why do you use that? Well, this is called a hydrogel. And what it has is a, a very um, large water content. And uh, what that allows you to achieve is very soft and deformable materials that are useful in medical applications. A lot of the cases are useful for cell growth. Uh, because when you embed cells in these environments, they can uh, grow pretty well because they can remodel their environment, degrade it, and move around. Okay, so these are some biocompatible um, microstructures um, that are used for medical applications. So it doesn't matter what you're extruding, as long as you can extrude it, you can always use this fused deposition modeling process, FDM, to manufacture it. And the, what the name means is fused deposition, okay? Uh, you're fusing what you're depositing, okay? So you're depositing this chocolate and it's at the same time because it's elevated temperature, it's fused to the bottom layers. It's fused to the other um, parts of this printed object, okay? So that's, that's what this is, is that you um, build up the structure, but what you're doing is you're building it up one point at a time. So again, if I go back here, the nozzle here has to scan the entire surface one point at a time as it adds up and extrudes material on top of the previous sequence. Now, as you can see, this process is going to be quite slow because it has to go through the entire volume of the object one point at a time. And if you want a very fine feature, if you want better resolution, you need to make the points, the spots, even smaller. As you make them smaller, as you can imagine, to scan the entire volume, it takes a lot, lot more time, okay? Even more time. So it takes a long while. It takes you two hours and a half to print a small um, one and a half inch object like that. The other problem is all these layers that make it rough on the outside, okay? So it's pretty rough. The texture is not that good. And all of this extra support material. Now, what is support material? Well, if you're printing something that's suspended, like the head of this object, you need to have some sort of a support holding it up while it's being processed and print, printed. So. What you have here is that a lot of this material is wasted and it's just used sacrificially to hold the part as it's being printed. Okay, so um, that's why this process isn't the best additive manufacturing process out there. There's another type which is called one dimensional.
In this case, you're printing a line at a time. So you print an entire line and then you move on to the next line. And then once you've done the layer, you go move on to the next layer, okay? And um, a good example of this is an inkjet process, okay? So you might have seen inkjet 2D printers, but here's an inkjet 3D printer, okay? What it does is that just like a 2D inkjet printer, it deposits material as it scans the surface, it's got a roller and it's got a set of nozzles. Um, so the nozzles there, okay, they deposit material and the rollers flatten it out. So if you look at this image, for instance, uh, what happens is that you've got a bunch of nozzles here, an array of nozzles, and they deposit a line of material because instead of one nozzle here, you have 20 nozzles, 100 nozzles. So they're able to actually deposit material in a line instead of one point, a lot of points along a line. And so once you've deposited that line of material, it's all going to be tiny droplets that haven't yet coagulated. So that's why it rolls on that surface. So it rolls onto it and then flattens out the object, uh, flattens out those droplets. And at the same time, you see the light there is used to cure the material into a single um, sort of object out of those droplets that were individual. Now you've rolled it into um, sort of a, a uniform layer and then you've cured it using the UV light. Okay, so that's how it works. It's got a, a linear deposition situation. So you deposit a line and then you roll it to flatten it out and you cure it to solidify it and then you move on to the next layer. Okay, so that's a, a one-dimensional process. And again, similar to a zero-dimensional process, you need to have support material, okay? But it's a lot faster. Yeah? And then it also gives you a much smoother look because those droplets, when they coalesce, they form a really nice and smooth outline. Now, again, this isn't the best, there's still a better version of that, and that is a two-dimensional additive process. What does this mean? This means that, of course, as the name suggests, we're printing a 2D part, a, a, a layer, an entire plane at a time. So instead of um, printing one point of the object at a time or depositing one point at a time or one line at a time, we're depositing an entire plane at a time. Now, how can we do that? How can we print an entire plane? Well, in the case of this zero dimensional one, we were depositing points or droplets or an extruded um, thin spaghetti of material. Here, we were depositing multiple droplets to make a line. So if we deposit a lot of points, it's a line. How can we deposit an entire plane? Well, the idea isn't to have a lot of droplets. Instead, it's to have a pool of liquid material that's sensitive to light. Okay, so this material here, when you shine light at it, it turns from liquid to solid. And then what we've got here is that we are projecting an image at this, and this image has a certain shape. So we have a projector here, just like your projector at home or in the class. We have a projector here that's projecting a 2D image. And then the regions of the image that are bright are going to turn into a solid. The dark regions are going to stay liquid. So you can selectively print any cross section that you want. That's exactly how we print the entire plane. And this is how it looks like. So we basically do the entire layer in one go, okay? So you're basically drawing this solid material out of a pool of liquid resin. And when you do that, in every layer, you're actually projecting an image from underneath, which is a 2D image. And then you're actually extracting the object as it's being built. The other problem here, uh, of course, like with the other processes, is that you have support structures 
But in this case, because the objects are suspended, you need some really tricky designs to use for these support materials. So you see all these um, weird branch structures that are holding these different pieces so that as it's suspended, it doesn't fall. Okay, so that's how you, you can print an object with an SLA process. And SLA means stereolithography. Lithography means giving shape with light. Litho is light. And graphy means drawing. So um, we're actually giving shape with light, but stereo means in a volume. Okay, so stereolithography is a, is a very useful process. And, and you typically do it with a DLP projector, but you can also do it with an LCD screen. Um, any means of producing a 2D image is fine. So um, that's how you go from zero dimensional to two dimensional. And so the idea is that all of these additively accumulate material on top of the previously accumulated material to build up the structure. But some of these do it in smaller subunits, such as the zero dimensional ones that deposit a point. Some of them do it in a one dimensional unit, which is in this case, an inkjet printer, a line and array of dots. And some do it in a 2D layer where it's actually a material, a liquid material that's sensitive to light and you're curing a 2D image into it using a projector here. And in all of these cases, you have to go layer by layer. So you have to, once you've completed one layer, which in best you can do the entire layer all at once. You have to then move on to the next layer and so on and so forth to build a stack of layer, uh, a stack of layers that gives you the full object. Okay, so and as you move to the right, you're going to get faster prints, you're going to get better appearances and smoother finishes, but it's always going to still be layered. Okay. Um, and the other concept is support materials, which I already pointed out. You're always going to need some sort of support material in your process. Okay, wonderful. So um, there is one question to ask here. Um, but before I get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, additive manufacturing mass customization. Uh, maybe I'll leave this actually for the next lecture and I will skip to this. Um, there is one question to ask, and that is, is there a way that we could, rather than printing a point or a line or a plane at once, is there a way that we could actually print an entire volume, a 3D volume, all at once? And I'll leave that question for you guys to look at and see what's out there. Um, has this been done already or not? And um, how, if, 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 if it can be done, how can it be done? And I will talk about that in um, the um, in-person class. Um, this isn't a part of your exam. This is just for your own um, knowledge and interest, if you're interested. Um, but we will talk about this in class um, in the in-person lecture. Um, but for the next lecture, I'm going to start from um, additive manufacturing mass customization. This one note that's remaining on additive manufacturing. And then we're going to talk uh, a little bit about polymer additives and other materials that we combine with polymers when manufacturing. And we're going to talk about some manufacturing concerns and considerations, and that will be it for the polymers of the course. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.